And welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion. It is episode 236. My name is Brando. Really excited for today's guest, acclaimed director, Rory Carf. Hopefully, he'll be adding a Scott Weiland documentary to his resume. Uh, Rory, first of all, before I get into anything with you, uh, just thanks for taking time out today to, to speak with me. Of course. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Where are you calling from today, if you don't mind me asking? I'm calling from my kitchen in Charlotte, North Carolina, oh. because my kitchen has the best reception. <laughs> gotcha. I like how specific you got. But that's the director in you. You want to paint a picture of exactly where you are. So thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, the reason I'm trying to tell the truth. <laughs> of course. Uh, the reason we're speaking with, with Rory today, I mean, you may know his work regardless, especially if you're a fan of, of ESPN. He's done a few of the 30 for 30s, including the awesome one about Ric Flair. I hate Christian Leitner. He has a uh, Snoop and Son, A Dad's Dream on Netflix, which was a, a great series. Just a lot of things that you've done in NASCAR and in UFC, but we're going to talk about today about a project that, that doesn't exist yet, I guess. So I guess to take it through where I went through, and I'll have you kind of take it from there. It was just the other day, just going through Twitter, and I see Alternative Nation uh, tweet an article about a Scott Weiland documentary, and I'm, I'm interested. You know, I am a huge fan of Scott Weiland, I, as we spoke about off the air, or as I've spoken about on the podcast I unfortunately I never got to see Stone Temple Pilots, but I did get to see Velvet Revolver twice. And you know, it's if I didn't witness Scott live, and that's what we're going to talk about—the Scott Weiland documentary. If I didn't see Scott Wy uh, live, I don't know if I—I I may have missed one of the best frontmen of my generation. And I often talk about mental health and addiction, and Scott often comes up. I've, I've had uh, former bandmates of his on the podcast, so he's just a. He's somebody that, that lives in this podcast and honestly still in my life. Every year was just uh, the anniversary of um, his passing and his birthday. So the documentary, as of now, it, it's offline, unfortunately, I believe. But the documentary got me so hyped, especially that you, uh, Scott's parents are in it. His wife, Jamie, is in it. So I guess we, we – where do we start? I, I guess what I, where I want to start, I guess, with you, Rory, is before we get to – what do we do where the project is now? How did this project start? Because uh, you said a lot off air that you were such a Stone Temple Pilots, Scott Weiland fan. So how did this project and when did it start for you? Well, yeah, like you said, I, I grew up with Stone Temple Pilots. I believe Core came out when I was in ninth grade and I was just hooked. And um, I remember e even with Stone Temple Pilots at the beginning, they were kind of uh, – kind of considered almost like a, a Pearl Jam knockoff and I just stuck with them and then I was blown away by the Purple Album and I've just been kind of a fan ever since into uh, where we are now through Velvet Revolver and, and Scott's solo stuff. So I always have had a dream of uh, doing something on Scott or the band um, and then by kind of happenstance uh, I got in touch a few years ago with Scott's wife, Jamie, uh, through a mutual friend. And um, I, I just felt there was such an opportunity to do something uh, for, for a number of reasons. Number one, like you said, Scott's an incredible front man. But um, his, his life and career, I, I felt, has been kind of, in a way, whitewashed. It's just kind of another drug cliche story. Yeah. The, the rock the rock star who went down a bad path of drugs and kind of like a flame that flickered too soon. And I just felt he was so much more than that, just as an artist, uh, an incredible frontman, incredible lyricist, performer, singer, like 
look at the vocal range that he has um, in his music, and he can do ballads and, and hard rock and pop and just Christmas so, albums. He never could. what's that Christmas yeah, albums? Christmas album. Yeah, fact, he can be a crooner. I mean, he he was just very very talented, and in my view, kind of underrated. Uh, still to this day, I, I, I would put him up as one of the greatest songwriters ever, like not just of my generation, but of all time. And he's not really talked about in that way because I think his troubled personal life kind of in a way almost overshadowed that from almost the time they started getting popular, he was in some kind of trouble. So, um, but I got in touch with Jamie, his wife, and, and we went out and, and we had uh, lunch and she was very hesitant to to talk to me. Really. Sure. Uh, I think, sure. I think in a way she almost had like a PTSD. She still does of Scott passing. And, um, it's very easy, I think, to make judgments from afar of someone and their, their family and their personal life. But it, it was very evident to me that she loved him and felt that she was in a way maybe misrepresented that's the way. So we just talked, and, and that's kind of how I start most of my relationship with with making films. And I've dealt with a lot of um, subjects where there's tragedy, people passing, tough subjects to talk about, deal with. So uh, I just try to be very genuine, heartfelt. I explained I was a fan. And we started talking, though, about um, Scott's mental illness mm -hmm. and how she felt that that wasn't was kind of just glossed over. And he had talked about it previously in interviews. He talked about it on Howard Stern. He talked about it when he was on Bill Maher. He discussed having uh, bipolar disorder. and But hearing it from his wife, it just kind of um, just kind of opened up a whole other window. And I thought it was an opportunity to make a film uh, about Scott and his legacy, but also about... Um, mental illness, but also like how kind of sometimes our greatest strength can also be our greatest weakness. And to me, that was Scott's mind. And uh, I kind of went down this road with Jamie and she introduced me to Scott's parents and we filmed a little sizzle reel. Uh, I think you called it a documentary. It, the documentary hasn't been shot or done. I just filmed the sizzle reel to kind of bring out market about what I thought the film could be and the way I would make it. Uh, and uh, that was about a year and a half ago. And I just decided recently, uh, based on the five-year anniversary of his pass passing, okay. to kind of put it out and see what the reaction uh, would be, just because I I'm just, it's a passion project of mine. It's try to tell this story, not just of Scott, but of mental illness and artistry, mm. and uh, a way to kind of make his story relevant to today. Well, you got a reaction out of me for sure, and and yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So I'm I'm glad that uh, over at Alternative Nation, Brett transcribed some of the videos. So I hope that Sizzle Reel does make its way back up again. Uh, I'd like to think you could with just the interviews because it, it it included music, and that could be tricky, you know. Uh, so yeah. I, I hope it gets put back up. But he transcribed some of the things that Jamie said that really hit home for me, and we spoke a, a little bit about this off the years. Uh, air, uh, Rory, about you know some of my addiction and, and uh, family issues that I've had with mental health, and my audience knows. Uh, Jamie said that Scott was uh, Scott on his meds was prepared, kind, thoughtful. When he would go off his meds, it was just a whirlwind of a disaster. His meds made him feel numb. When you're an artist and you don't want to feel numb, uh, he wanted to be in touch with his angst and his pain. Now I really. That was my worry when I had to start going on medication. I'm like, I'm a silly guy. I'm a radio personality. Is this going to totally mellow me out kind of thing? But thankfully, I have a great therapist. That never really was the case. Uh, another thing that she said uh, that I just want to make sure I get out there, uh, people insinuated that I should leave him because he was mentally ill. If I told you that my husband had cancer, would you say, oh, he has cancer, get rid of him? It's the same thing. It's not like you wake up one day and you want to act crazy or paranoid or hurt people around you uh, that you love or hurt yourself. So that, that really hit me, you know, with a father who had uh, an addiction issue, you know, with me who has, uh, I just, five years, no alcohol, uh, I think as of just a few days ago, you know, it's, 
it hit me on top of just being a fan of STP Velvet Revolver. So I I want to I want people to know about this passion project of yours because you're right. He it does get lost, and I loved how in the sizzle reel you included Demi Lovato and uh, Pete Davidson from SNL because it's the same thing. And you can tell me your opinion on this. Uh, it's what I see articles about Scott Weiland or Demi Lovato or Pete Davidson, anybody with some sort of mental illness, just the, the comments and articles. It's just like, it's a stigma that still needs to be broken. We wouldn't be saying this about people with cancer, you know, just like Jamie Weiland said. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, um, it's like anything else, unless someone has experience with it, it's, uh, they just maybe have a hard time having empathy. Um, kind of like, oh, what do you have to be upset about? You're rich and famous, boo, hoo, hoo. And, and they, I just, uh, it's just a ignorance and lack of understanding about uh, how these people are suffering. And, you know, I don't know Demi Lovato or Pete Davidson, but from what I understand, um, you know, it's a, it's a two-sided coin. Sure. That their, their, their artistry and brilliance uh, is, is very tied in to some ways in their sickness. And it really has to be managed. And you've seen it with Debbie Lovato. I mean, she's kind of gone up and down. And you'll hear she has a couple of years sobriety and then she kind of falls off. And it's not a straight path with mental illness, too. Right. It's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a lifelong struggle. And you saw Scott would have a couple of good years um, where it looked like he kind of was having things together. So um, I just was interested in exploring it. And I didn't want to do, and I don't want to do just another you know, rock star falling from grace, like a behind the music. Right. That's not what I'm interested in. And I just think it's an important story. And these situations, especially with music, it gets complicated, man, because different people hold the right. And a lot of times when somebody has had a chaotic life and then they pass, it means they've left a lot of chaos in their wake as well. And hurt feelings and, and, and all of that. So, while it's been five years since he passed, I think a lot of wounds are still fresh. And I am an outsider. You know, I didn't know Scott personally at all. So it's, it's in some ways, you know, coming in, uh, not knowing the family and <clears throat> some of the bandmates and stuff. Uh, it's been difficult to try to kind of get footing and get this project off the ground. So, well, how you were... know, that's kind of where we're at. Well, how were were his his parents? Because that's got to be so difficult, you know. It, yeah, yeah, fresh five years later, it's been. Well, you know, you know what a lot of people don't realize mm-hmm. is uh, Scott's parents lost both sons with drugs. I you know, know that Scott's brother Michael Scott's brother Michael died too. Oof. So this is a mother who's lost two sons, and. Uh, it's, uh, I went to meet them. They, you know, they live in uh, Colorado. And I flew out to meet them before we did the interview. And they had, Scott's mother was hesitant too. Uh, you know, again, you don't know. So you kind of, to me, you have to, you have to sit down with them, meet them. I, I'm not a journalist. Like, I'm not looking to, like, crack a story. I'm looking to tell a story. Mm. And I try to do it, um, you know, from my heart. And, be real about it. So, uh, anyway, when I went to meet Scott's parents, I had to like, I almost died on my way there because, and I'm not exaggerating. It was an insane snowstorm through the mountains of Colorado. And my, I, I had a rental car and almost, I couldn't see like wow. five feet in front of me. And I, I almost went off the mountain. Like two, two of my wheels were hanging off. And I was so flabbergasted and kind of out of it when I went and met with them. Like, I just wasn't, like, nervous at all or anything because I – and I kind of just explained what had happened. And we really hit it off. Like, we were laughing and having mm-hmm. a good time. We went out to dinner. And Jamie told me that they said, no, Rory's, Rory's good. We're, we're good with him. We'll do the interview. And I really enjoyed meeting them. Um, and, you know, that's – she doesn't know Scott, like, while in the rock star. She, it's just her son. Right. And – um he he had a pretty normal sounding childhood from what I heard from them. Um, there was a revelation that he was raped when he was younger, uh, which I hadn't known about. And a lot of times uh, trauma can, uh, especially repressed trauma, can come out in other ways. 
Yeah. So I think he, that was something that happened to him. He talked about it in his book, I believe, but, um, and it kind of stayed with him. But, you know, his parents, the mom says it in the sizzle reel that she doesn't want Scott just to be remembered as a drug addict. Right. He was so much more than that. So I think that was the motivation for doing the interview. And uh, they they saw the story I wanted to tell and, and were on board. It seems like that would be agreed upon uh, with everybody because I know what it's like uh, after – you know, somebody passes away tragically and what that could, how that could fracture our family. But that seems like the, the common theme would be, okay, I, we would like Scott Weiland to be remembered to, for more than being just, you know, why maybe he gets lost in the weeds that people label him as just a, a junkie, which is just a, is, is unfair. So how does Mary Weiland feel about it? Is that something that, cause you would think that she would have that same want and, and maybe everybody can work with you and with a certain way of wanting the story to be told, but to not want, I don't know. So I get, you know, how does Mary feel about it? If you don't mind me asking. Well, I can't speak for her. I mean, she put out a statement after he passed, I think to Rolling Stone. Um, I met with her one time and uh, she was very pleasant, you know, and she's, she's, um, has two children to, uh, care for, you know, I think sure. that's her priority. But, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's complicated and I think, uh, you know, she has a point of view and current, uh, family might have a point of view and those could differ. And it's like, you see it a lot. I mean, how long did it take for the Kurt Cobain film to come out? I mean, a long time after he passed away and you think, you know, there was Courtney Love was fighting with other bandmates and then the uh, Kurt's daughter. Was she talking to her mother? There's a lot of, you know, it's like a divorce. Yeah. A, a really, really messy divorce is the way. And, and, and they, fans have been described as being like a marriage. And, you know, Scott wasn't with Stone Temple Pilot when he passed away. And they kind of had it, they broke up again. And um, so there's, and that band is still out uh, trying to move on with a different singer. Yeah. So, it's not easy. I, I w- my wish would be to be able to get in a room with people. I think that's more difficult now, obviously, sure. with uh, the pandemic. But maybe when things calm down and you can kind of talk to people face to face and see what they think and what their hesitations or reservations might be um, and kind of talk it out. But these things take a long time. I will say, like, look at Bohemian Rhapsody. That film was in development since, from what I understand, since Freddie Mercury passed away. That film was in development. Look how long it took to come out. Wow. Long time. A lot of iterations, you know. Sasha Baron Cohen was attached to it. Then he dropped out. A lot of different directors. So uh, my hope is that this this can happen um, and the film will come out. And if if my version doesn't come out, whatever does come, uh, is respectful and uh, just uh, utilizes all of the you know footage of Scott that's out there and his music and his writing and all of that. What other? Because it, it, that's what really blew me away that you were able to speak with Jamie and Scott's parents. Uh, have you been able to do? I'm assuming pre-pandemic. That uh, I, I mean, obviously pre-pandemic. I, I don't know if you've done anything since really just kind of off the record, but have you interviewed anybody else uh, since he was with the wildabouts at the time? Did you try to interview anybody from uh, the wildabouts since that was, you know, he was on tour with them when he passed? No, I mean, I have my own production company and so I funded it myself out of pocket, you know, um, somebody wasn't bankrolling it, uh, but I, I just felt with the. I just wanted to kind of be able to show representation of what the film could be. Oh, okay. Then once the film, you know, that was my goal. Like, hey, this is the style, and that you'll see that there's some people. You know, it, we have his wife, we have his parents, and we have this way of telling the story uh, through this lens and that would make it unique and try to sell it. And I did meet with different uh, venture capitalists, and I had a, a company ready to put up seven figures. And I think that's what's really frustrating at this point to me is I had the money to make. And it's, 
that's a lot harder to get than it may sound. I mean, it sounds I hard. <laughs> it sounds hard. Somebody who yeah. doesn't make money off a podcast, it sounds hard. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. And people think sometimes um, that if you just have a good idea, you can take it out. And it's, it's it, man, I mean, I, I face so much rejection in my life. Mm. Uh, and I'm not just talking about personally in high school, I'm talking professionally taking projects out. So, um, it's, it's, you know, going to places and pitching things. So the fact that somebody was willing to put up money, a significant amount of money for a documentary, which is, you know, most documentaries are, you know, anywhere between, you know, maybe 600,000 to the 1.2, 1.3 million range. So they were in the higher range of that. And, um, you know, they, they, they eventually, you know, saw that it was, it couldn't happen at that moment. And, kind of moved on so that, that's frustrating because we could have been going into production mm-hmm. well that, that's still very inspiring the the route that you really someone who as acclaimed as you are again you, you've won uh awards and have been featured just on, on major networks uh that you are just very well aware of how long the process can be you don't let it deter you and that also includes just knowing how many times you've been rejected and that's you know, obviously, all the times that you ha- weren't rejected, uh, there were even successes and fails there. So it's just you're fighting through it, and that's what I, I, I'm hoping to, you know, help you in a way to get you know the voice out there because I want to see this happen. You know, I, this is yeah. what got me excited. What you could do, I just didn't know if you were okay. You had the sizzle reel made, and then um, you know sometimes you're just you know how sometimes you collect audio or you collect documents if you were just collecting things along the way that like okay this may be good for the future i could use possibly use this here or it's just been completely at a um you know let's continue no i mean just the just the sizzle reel probably cost okay. about twenty five twenty five thousand dollars out of pocket to go wow to, you know the, the travel and the crew and editing and uh, we did a couple of different shoots you know as you saw we uh, it was a, there's a lot involved um in, in putting this stuff together at a uh, especially at a certain production quality um at which we, I wanted to do but yeah man i mean it's uh it's called show business you know, it, it is a business sure and uh people have their own points of view and motivation and uh you know every great success story starts with adversity so I'm hoping this is the case. And I wanted to put it out there just, I, I you know, it, the YouTube sizzle got pulled within two days. It wasn't even up 48 hours. And uh, at that time, uh, the impressions on Twitter, it had, I believe, 380,000 impressions nice. um, in, in less than two days. It came out at, a, you know, with no promotion. I just put, I have my own Twitter I have like 5,000 followers. So it's not like I have a huge following. Right. I have tweeted. So it, was, it started to build organically. I think if it would have stayed up for a week or so, it right. would have been over a million. I, I think we, we can blame Alternative Nation because I think they called attention to it. <laughs> I think that's what happened. Well, you know what? At some point, it, it, attention's going to get to it one way or the other. Sure. And I was just hoping that somebody, you never know unless you, you, you put something out there and, um, you know, my goal wasn't to upset anyone in, in his family or, or former band members or whatnot, but just to show like, you know, you don't make, you don't also, you don't make, uh, you don't get wealthy off of documentaries, like one-offs. Um, you know, they're, they're made for a certain budget. You get a chunk of that and, and kind of go on. But I think it's important. And um, I feel like his story could affect a lot of people. And there's something about music that's just so different, I, I feel, than any other kind of artistry. It's really hard to explain. Like, have you ever tried to explain, like, your favorite song to someone? It's just, there's so many factors that go into it. It's where you were when you heard it, what it means to you in your personal life, like, what you were going through. Do the lyrics speak to you? It's, it's crazy. Um, and it's just one of those things that, to me, it's so special. And his music was, is still so special to me and what it's meant to me in my life. And, you know, like I, uh, the right song can talk you off the ledge. Right. As, you know, as crazy as that sounds, I'm sure 
and you know, it's those same, the right music can make you want to run through a wall. Uh, like as far as getting you excited and pumped up and, and think about, I, I work out the guns and roses all the time. Nice. Um, they, they, they still do it for me. So I think that's where, uh, the music really, I feel like lives on forever. And, um, God's music will do that. And I think he's going to get more and more appreciated as an artist as time goes on. I hope so. I yeah. hope so. Especially yeah. after speaking with his son, Noah, and just seeing like, wow, they're so similar, you know, and, and just hoping the best for his career. I think they have a new single coming out either uh, today I'm, as I'm recording this or the day after. So I wish nothing for the best for his uh, his son. And I hope, um, because this is what the trailer said, and we'll talk about, I guess, the what future possibly it could have uh, returning online. A uh, trailer for the documentary of the life of musician Scott Weiland and his lifelong struggle with mental illness. First row films and filmmaker Rory Carf are, uh, include, are currently trying to make the film but have faced some obstacles by others. So if you'd like to see this version of Scott's story get uh, made into a film, please like and share. So we obviously can't like and share yet. Is there a, a loophole to get the trailer back on, possibly just putting – interviews up without the music rights loop like thing going on um is there a future for the trailer or do you is it just is it, it's gone <laughs> i hope it's, i hope it's not well uh it, it's gone for now i mean it's I, I don't know if you could tell scott's story without without the music I, I, it's just it, it would be i don't know man. it's like chocolate cake without chocolate it's sure it's not the same you know so but just to get the uh, the interview scene, I think not the movie, not the, yeah. the the potential documentary without his music, but for some people to see the sizzle reel and to spread the word about this potential documentary, could you possibly put up clips of his parents speaking or uh, Jamie speaking and just use that for now to escape the as a sizzle reel the the loopholes of music. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's more than the music though. Okay. Um, okay. There's other there's a, there's other things as far as uh, I mean I can't get too into it. But okay, understood. Uh, other, other people, uh, yeah, other people uh, have expressed that they wanted it down too. So I okay. just, I, I put it out. I'm not saying I won't put something out again uh, in the near future, but. Um, you know, I just, in a way, wanted to try to bring attention to the project again because it's just stalled, at least from my end. Uh, and I've tried every avenue to go down um, to try to make something. And, you know, you mentioned Scott's son. I, I think it would be really hard to make something without his kids involved. I, if I did something, they have, a, they have a, a point of view that's really unique, and I think they should be in it. So. Mm. Uh, trying to make something where everyone's in it, his band members, his parents, his current wife, his ex-wife, his kids, it's really difficult. Um, there's uh, sometimes time heals wounds, you know, um, and I'm hoping that that happens, but it's uh, it's not easy. Well, so I, I trying I, to get, it's like a convention of like ex-wives, or something, <laughs> like your ex-husband's getting together and like all the different children, and you bring them all in the room. Or something. It's just, uh, it, you know, I saw, I'll tell you one thing though, I, and this is because you're going to say, like, how is this even related? But they had a Fresh Prince of Bel Air reunion. Yeah. And, and they had the mom that was like kicked off the show. Yep. I know you're talking back about on. the and, first Aunt Viv. Yeah. And, <laughs> right. But like, that's been a long time, like a long time to get her back and into the fold. So I'm hoping it doesn't take that long um, and uh, that, you know, uh, I, I, and this is the thing too, I would say is taking this angle with mental illness, like you responded to it. I got a lot of responses from other people too, emails, messages on uh, direct DMs and from all different kinds of people, a couple of celebrities. And uh, I think that resonated with people. It did. I think it resonated a lot. Uh, so, but you know, there's no just one right way to tell a story, and other people have my, they have their own way they would want to tell Scott's story, and think it would be better. So it is subjective. I'll say that. Is there anything we, we can do currently to to help to get the word out since we can't share the trailer at just, the moment? 
storm the White House. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm on my way. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, I, I, I think it's just bringing attention to the project and showing that there's an interest in it uh, is one way. Um, but the band, STP, uh, you know, hitting up their social media, maybe that's something, letting them know you'd like to see something. And, um, and, and you know, I, I think. I do think they have their own projects in the works too. So that's where it gets a little complicated, but I think, you know, there's room, uh, there's room for more than one film that I wish people would understand that too. There were two fire fest documentaries. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. So I mean, Steve jobs, I mean, there's two currently banned versions of LA guns. So there's plenty of room for, (laughs) for everything. So I, I, if it was just as simple as telling the story, uh, it, it'd be great. But uh, these things, you know, I'm, 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 I try to be patient, and also I, I, I don't easily give up. And it's just, it's a, it's a really fine line, Brandon, too, between being persistent and being like pushy and overly pushy. You're right. And I want to get it mm-hmm. done, but I also don't want to like burn down bridges in the process. That's a if that's that an interesting. It, it does. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's a dance. Yeah, and you can you can do that. You it, it, it's like if you sit there quiet, like meek, like a mouse, nothing will happen. But if you also yell and scream, uh, uh, no one's going to want to work with you either. If they you know think like God, man, what what an asshole. <laughs> so I'm right. trying. Yeah. So I didn't. I don't want to like you know put people on blast and and burn the whole house down. I just hope that you know, maybe we can meet up and people will uh, think that there's a way to tell this story. And, um, you know, the other thing too is it's such a difference financially between a documentary and a movie. And sometimes people think, oh, like, you know, what what, what am I getting? Like, how much money am I going to make? How many millions? And it's like, look, the budget is like a million dollars. You make the whole thing. So you're not going to get very much money. And the motivation uh, should be about, and the motivation seems to be, Oh, what it should be is your motivation, and that's to tell the sc- the story of Scott and how he is so much bigger than what we we think he is. And to, to hear I agree, people who love you know, him, it shouldn't be about you know his parents are not talking to you for money. They want to talk about no. their son. They 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 miss their son, and they want to share you know stories with people who love him as almost as much as they do. You know, it's it's fan. It's, no, I know, but you got to be realistic. Of as course, far as, of course. Uh, you know, like Ric Flair. You brought up that project. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, he he was excited just to have a thirty for thirty done on them. <laughs> and I think what he, what he got, like he didn't necessarily make money beyond licensing pictures and and videos and stuff, and it wasn't very much. But he understood that it, it put him back in the zeitgeist of pop culture, right? And it's hard to put a price tag on that. Good so point. Rick, right? Rick, you know, he was trending on Twitter and social media for like. 18 hours at that point and he wasn't currently wrestling or doing anything so he was back back in the mix everybody was talking about him and you know it led to other things like a new contract and and advertising and and tons of other things right so he did have a little bit of a financial windfall and sometimes it's hard to explain like to see the forest from the trees and it gets frustrating sometimes i'm not saying in this case but i've seen others where people will bend over dollars to pick up pennies and it's like look let this come out like i i read that when the the movie the dirt came out on netflix like motley cruise ice cream sales like went up like 1200 percent that week or something like it was insane how much more music they started selling based off of that movie and people were talking about motley crew again that's a really a great good point. band that's a yeah, great so example I think, yeah Wow, because I interviewed Nikki think- Six talking about the dirt, like when I first started radio, and that movie took forever, mm-hmm. you know. So wow, it did. It took a long time, and and uh, Stone Temple Pilots is incredibly. They have talented musicians beyond Scott, obviously the DeLeo brothers and Eric Krebs, and they're great musicians. But uh, uh, you know, are they relevant right now in this moment? And this could maybe bring that back, and same for. Uh, his other iteration that Scott was involved in. So I think there would be an opportunity for that. Well, I, I, 
I appreciate everything that you're you're doing because I think this is a story that should be told. That you have the right mindset of what you've been able to accomplish so far, even albeit in just encapsulated in a sizzle reel, is is quite uh quite amazing. So if you just want to reach out to Corey and, and yeah, maybe if you want to tag the uh, Deleo brothers, if you want to tag, you know, Slash or uh, Dave Kushner, you know, from Velvet Revolver, anyone that you would love to see, you know, help Rory make this uh, documentary, uh, Rory Karf, uh, K A R P F on uh, on Twitter, RoryKarf dot com. Um, I, I can't thank you enough. This was really exciting, and uh, I'll just say because I think why Scott's death hits I think differently to some people, including me, is the age, and the age being because it's like a, it's a father's age. It's not mm-hmm. Kurt Cobain. It's not Amy Winehouse. That they're all terrible. You know, obviously, they, you know, I'm not. That's I'm not comparing it that way. But from my perspective, and pr- maybe from the perspective of, of other fans who reached out to you. Who who have lost a parent or someone older uh, to to drugs or, or suicide, mental health? I think that's something that people don't realize. He's rich. He has kids. He is what well, you know. But no, it's as you said. It's it's a mental illness is just like an everyday battle. I forgot how you phrased it earlier, but it's just it's it's you know it's a roller coaster. And and Scott obviously had mm-hmm. his demons, and I don't I I never looked down on him because of it, and it really. As just a fan, it hit me really hard. So, you know, anything that I can do other than just getting the word out, um, um, I'd be happy to. But uh, th- this in itself was a pleasure, Rory. And I hope next time we do speak, you know, we'll be talking about the next phase of this uh, this doc. I appreciate it for sure. And uh, I don't know if Lane Staley's family's listening, but let's make a film on him too. Just throwing that out there. Uh, no, I'm just kidding about that. I no. was think Lane Staley would be awesome. No, but um, you're not I kidding. Think you, Lane you, Staley. Yeah. We got to get a Rory uh, car for Rent Lane Staley. We got to get you to do an Axl Rose or Guns N' Roses one. Uh, you're the guy. There's a there's a there's a lot of them, you know. And um, I think like with with mental illness or when someone passes, especially well, a celebrity. Cornell, sure. mm-hmm. Yeah, Chris Cornell, Chester Bennington. Yep, I mean, yep. those, uh, the list. Uh, I, sadly uh goes on and on yeah. i think that um i think that scott uh it, it goes both ways he 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 should be remembered much more than a drug addict um but you know he also uh it, it shouldn't be eulogized as a perfect angel he, he was a real person who had real problems who was a brilliant artist and uh struggled and i think a lot of people could relate to that yep. and um, I think, uh, you know, people like you bringing attention to it, I appreciate it. And hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll help from your uh, lips to God's ears. Right on. Thank you, Rory, so much for this. And I hope we get to do it again soon. Appreciate it. Take care, Brandon. And thank you for once again stepping inside the podcast ring. That's so- yes, Axel. Uh, that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. Thanks again for, for hanging out where we look at life through guns and rose-colored glasses. Uh, it's appetite for distortion. And it's hard to believe that 2020 is almost over. I really appreciate And I shared many of them, but many of them were, uh, by them I mean the Spotify wrapped. I'm sure you've seen, you know, whether you're it's on Twitter or Instagram or any of the social media, people are sharing either their end-of-the-year playlists, but that also pertains to podcasts. So many of you have shared that with me, that... I was the top, if not close to the top, podcast that you listened to this year. So thank you so much. That means the world to me. And hey, if you, uh, your significant other or your, your friend also listens to the podcast, buy them the gift of an Appetite for Distortion t-shirt. Now available via Redbubble. You like that? That's how my audition tape for future sponsorship. <laughs> Oh, so sad. Um, so what is to come on the podcast? Well, stick around, follow on social media, facebook.com slash the AFD show. Social media is where the conversation continues between the broadcasts. Uh, Twitter, at the AFD show. Instagram, Appetite for Distortion. YouTube page as well, Appetite for Distortion. I want to keep promoting that since I've been pretty active on on, uh, on YouTube the past a few months. Should have been doing it all these years, but... I don't know. That's a story for another time. 
So when will you see the next episode? When's the next AMT show? Well, the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy. You'll see it. I don't know if soon is the word. Yeah! Thanks to the lame-ass security, I'm going home.